Well, Jen is the Knafs Fellow in the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, and she recently received her PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Biological Oceanography with a specialization in interdisciplinary environmental research. And her background is both in ecology and economics that supported her dissertation work on ecosystem services associated with human impact, uh, impacted systems, specifically the deep sea and urban environments. And she's talking about using deep sea imagery to ca characterize ecosystem services associated with methane seeds. All right. Uh, thanks, Anne, for uh, the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here, uh, here virtually uh, because of all of the recent events going on. Um, so, yeah, I'm Jen. Uh, I'm the Canals Fellow in the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research this year. Um, and I will be presenting on uh, just a sliver of my PhD dissertation. Uh, talking about how we can use deep sea imagery to examine ecosystem services associated with methane seeps. And I just want to start by um, acknowledging my co oh. nope. my co-authors, uh, Dr. Lisa Levin at Scripps, and then Dr. Pete Gerges um, at Harvard, and then also my sources of uh, support from uh, Scripps, and then o also Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, which provided uh, all of the video data that I'll be talking about. Um, but first off, uh, the deep sea is generally defined as below 200 meters of water depth, uh, making it the largest biome on Earth uh, and covering 95% of ocean volume. Uh, and we used to think that there was nothing down there because it's dark, deep, cold, high pressure, but now we know it uh, hosts a variety of different um, habitats like methane seeps, uh, foreshadowing, uh, and also different organisms like the sea anemone on a sponge stock. And because uh, these places are so remote, you may think that um, what we do on the surface doesn't impact what happens at the bottom of the ocean, but we know that it, there's increasing human impact in the deep sea. Um, and this is due to uh, increasing demand for natural resources, things like food, energy, and minerals, as well as more indirect impacts like pollution uh, and climate change. Um, and we've been notoriously bad as a society with balancing conservation with uh, different forms of economic development. And the problem isn't so much that we have, uh, we have these industries, it's more that the regulation and the baseline knowledge um, about these systems kind of lags behind the industry and the impact. So we don't really know what's going on until after it's too late. And part of that is because uh, we're quite interested in the, the resources that we can extract from, from these places. Um, and this is where ecosystem services can play a really large role. Uh, so what are ecosystem services? So ecosystems have a structure associated with them, so physical, chemical, and biological characteristics. Uh, so here we have pictured a methane seep. It has a flow regime, a chemical makeup, and a biological community that's associated with it that's then going to support a function or an ecological process. So here we have this orthogenic carbonate um, that's acting as a site for these fish to aggregate on, which then we'll eat. So providing us with a service of so the direct or indirect benefits to human well-being. Um, and there are a lot of these um, examples of ecosystem services in the deep sea, uh, including fishery services. Uh, so things that we eat, like ruffy, Oreos, and Patagonian toothfish, as well as things that we extract for um, things like jewelry, so bamboo, coral, and then also uh, these sponges that are uh, actually collected and given as gifts at, uh, at weddings in Japan. Uh, there are also things like marine genetic resources, so um, uh, stuff that we collect for uh, pharmaceutical and industrial applications. So two worm hemoglobin as a template for artificial blood, armor inspired by scaly foot snails, enzymes for scrubbing carbon dioxide, DNA polymerase, and then uh, super, superconductors of light. Uh, and then we also have more large spatial scale, long time scale uh, regulating services. So things that are 
processes that are very important to global ocean health. So biogeochemical cycling on hydrothermal vents, um, nutrient cycling and um, element cycling, and then carbon sequestration and burial, which has been uh, a pretty hot topic uh, in recent news. Um, so here I just have on the right is uh, just a depiction of the biological pump where primary production at the surface then gets um, uh, buried at the at depth. Um, so, um, so there are all of these processes, both ecological and physical, that kind of contribute to um, human benefit. Um, but the issue is that these aren't historically considered in environmental management. So our focus has often been on um, biodiversity. So uh, what I consider structure of um, of ecosystems. But as we begin to um, connect these uh, structures with uh, functions and services, we can then directly link uh, these ecosystems and what they're doing with human well-being. Um, uh, and this is not a new concept by any means, but it's very difficult to do. So a lot of people don't end up doing it. Nonetheless, in the deep sea where we don't know very much about anything. Uh, but when we do try to go and um, figure more things out about uh, deep ocean habitats, we're often on these uh, research expeditions on different vessels with really cool instrumentation that includes remotely operated vehicles, uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, and even human occupied vehicles. Um, and while we're out sampling and studying these deep sea habitats, what we often collect um, is deep sea imagery. So here, hopefully this works, or maybe it won't. <laughs> um, anyways, if you Google um, tanner crabs on the Cascadia margin on Ocean Networks Canada, you'll see you'll a YouTube video will pop up on. Um, it's just a bunch of crabs that are commer a commercial species um, that are attracted to a, a bubbling at the bottom of the ocean. And we don't know why these crabs are attracted to the, this bubbling, but um, it's an important kind of observation of what's happening down at, at, at depth. Um, but this type of imagery is also, is collected on all of these different research expeditions and it often sits untouched in repositories uh, in somebody's lab or online, um, kind of uh, representing a source of knowledge that we really haven't fully utilized yet. So uh, the objective of this project was to see whether we can start using this imagery to characterize ecosystem services. So specifically, I'll be looking at fisheries and carbon services uh, with a focus on megafauna at and around methane seeps. Um, but first, a quick primer on methane seeps. Uh, so what what are they? Uh, so methane seeps are just places at the bottom of the ocean where methane, uh, surprise, surprise, seeps uh, from the seafloor. Uh, so, and as this methane comes up through the sediment, it is oxidized or eaten by uh, microbes. Uh, and oftentimes that, um, that can be coupled with things like uh, sulfate reduction, which then produces uh, these um, species. Uh, and that hydrogen sulfide in the middle is then eaten by the bacteria that we see here on the surface, so the yellow and white. Uh, that bacteria is then eaten by worms. Uh, the worms are eaten by fish, and the fish are eaten by me. Uh, so this represents a fishery service. Um, another result from this uh, reaction is that this methane is prevented from coming higher up the water column and perhaps eventually to the atmosphere. Um, as well as this bicarbonate species that is then going to, uh, that can uh, increase in concentration and then eventually precipitate out, locking up that carbon at the bottom of the ocean, uh, which presents us with uh, some carbon services. So in 2015, uh, Ocean Exploration Trust uh, did a research expedition at the, off the coast of Southern California, where they visited uh, several different sites, including some methane seeps that we're going to use as kind of a case study or an example of how we can, we can start to utilize this video um, and picture uh, information. Um, so we have three different dive sites at different latitudes, at different depths, um, and each of these dives 
were ranged from seven to six hours long, or, or seven to 16 hours long, sorry. Um, and these dives were cut up into five minute clips, uh, which then I used as a sample, like pseudo samples, which isn't ideal, but um, the purpose of, of this was to kind of see how we can use this very, very expensive to get data um, and use it in some sort of meaningful way. So you can imagine that taking all of the ship time with all of these expensive instruments can be very, very costly. And so then what, what types of observations do we make with these videos? Um, here is a screenshot of just a plain bottom sediment um, habitat that we will then kind of characterize the physical environment as well as what the uh, remotely operated vehicle, the ROV, is doing. So we're off-site, but we're moving towards our methane seep. Uh, we have a soft sediment bottom with lots of pits and burrows, and then there are some particulates in the water column that you can see. Uh, and then we're also going to um, characterize the biological community. So we see this jelly, uh, these anemones, this crab, and then this grenadier fish. Uh, and then with all of these different types of organisms, we're going to characterize what they're doing. So with this fish, it's demersal. So within a one body length of the bottom, it's um, over soft sediment and it's uh, swimming. So at the end of the day, we get this kind of uh, this characterization of the biological community that's associated with these different sites. So we identified over a hundred different morphotypes. Uh, so just organisms that were loosely based on um, or grouped on what they look like. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the, the expert IDs on some of that. Um, and then they were loosely grouped into different functional groups. So um, it was really cool because two of these sites had never been visualized before. Um, so we got to, to do the first biological um, characterization of them. Um, but we're still just looking at diverse or biodiversity here, still kind of looking at the structure of these um, systems. So what, so what can we do to take this a step further? Um, so what I did was I looked at our two ecosystem services um, that we were aiming for. So fishery services and carbon services, and then chose some observable traits that could be associated with those things. So is this fish or is this fish morphotype um, commercially valuable? It, does it eat something commercially valuable? Does something commercially valuable eat it? And then I gave those different modalities um, kind of a score based on the contribution to that ecosystem service. So if it's commercial, then it's obviously going to, to contribute to fishery services. Um, so just as an example, uh, we have this cute little cat shark here, um, and it's going to score a three out of four with fisheries and then a 14 out of 17 with the carbon scores. Um, uh, and then so each video or each morphotype was assigned a score and then each video was assigned a score based on the average score of the morphotypes found in that video um, for a reason that I will happily get into if anyone wants to know. <laughs> um, but anyways, then our videos were uh, compared, our sites were compared using Prescott Wallace uh, with a post hoc done test if needs be. So what did our results show? Um, so just to orient you at first on the x-axis, we have the different sites. So Point Dune, Palos Verdes, and Del Mar. This is from north to south. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have different carbon, uh, different scores. So either carbon or fisheries. Here we have carbon. So we see that Del Mar, and, and these are quartiles, not standard error. Um, so Del Mar had higher carbon scores than the other dive sites. But if we look at fisheries scores, it also had higher, um, higher scores than our other sites, uh, which may imply that Del Mar has uh, or may support traits that contribute more to carbon and fishery services. Um, and you know, this has uh, management implications for identifying priorities for spatial protections. And I just want to point out here um, that the Pacific Manage or Pacific Fishery Management Council has actually now recognized methane seeps as essential fish habitat. So in this figure, um, which is a little bit out of date now, we see the southern coast of uh, the coast of Southern California. 
in red, we have proposed um, protected areas from benthic trawling. Uh, and in that uh, or yellow uh, oval, we have these little uh, triangles that represent different methane seeps. So there's been a lot of interest in what um, what these methane seeps are providing for, for local fisheries. Um, and then another important kind of distinction that we made within our videos uh, was the amount of seep activity that we saw. Um, so on the left, we have kind of non-seep background, a picture of non-seep background where it's just soft sediment. There's nothing to indicate, there's no visual indicator to, to suggest that there's any seepage. Uh, in the middle, we have two different types of transition where we have either very sparse uh, vis uh, indicators of very sparse uh, seepage or um, kind of prior seepage with these carbonates. Oh, and then on the right, we have kind of active seepage with like uh, very, um, very large microbial mats and or bubbling. Um, so if we then take a closer look at our data and look at kind of the different, so this is the same thing, except now we've uh, separated everything out into seep activity. So green is active seep, blue is transition, and then uh, brown is background. Uh, and if we take a look just at Point Doom, uh, we'll see that within the fishery scores, uh, the uh, background, um, the background areas had higher um, scores than the active and transition areas. Um, but if we take a look at the other sites, so if we look at Palos Verdes, we see that transition has higher um, scores than your active and background areas. So this implies that seep activity has differential impacts on ecosystem services scores. Um, so there are a couple of reasons why this may be, prob probably due to kind of synergistic effects from other environmental variables that we haven't accounted for. So these sites were at different depths, uh, which could uh, indicate different amounts of food availability, as well as um, on the coast of Southern California, there is an oxygen minimum zone that our, um, that our Point Doom site uh, sits in the middle of. And you can imagine that uh, low oxygen, as well as kind of methane seepage, uh, which often uh, results in high uh, sulfitic water, uh, would be a little bit too much um, too much physiologically for a lot of the organisms that are living there, but at Palos Verdes, where we're a little bit out of the out of the oxygen minimum zone, you don't have as much uh, pressure from that um, oxygen stress. Uh, you might see a little bit more um, more organisms at the at those methane seeps. Um, yeah. So in summary, uh, we kind of introduced this framework for for ecosystem based uh, imagery analysis and then by leveraging these different existing deep sea images imagery and then also kind of a trait based um, tool that already exists um, to be able to make these relative comparisons among locations and different settings um, and then i also just want to point out that you know a lot of this data already exists um, and kind of sits unused in a lot of places uh, so you know as we kind of develop different different approaches to, to utilizing all this data, advances in machine learning and image detection could really help mine the wealth of uh, deep sea imagery. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Jen. We do have um, one question that I'm gonna split into two to start off with. While scores provide a sense of value, they're not necessarily a quantitative measure that can be evaluated in terms of the larger ecosystem, or mm -hmm. can they? Oh, okay, uh, or can they, sorry, I missed the second part mm -hmm. of your uh, question. Um, so, yeah, so definitely the project that I was working on was definitely more of a proof of concept with like, what can we do with this data that exists, that no one utilizes, um, and, you know, it's kind of the reason why I mentioned that, like, these scores are based on kind of the average of the morphotype, because also with Ocean Exploration Trust, a lot of times, you know, we're not, we can't take um, kind of repeated quantitative transects, uh, video transects with, with these types of cruises, just because it takes too much time, and it's, it may or may not be worth the, that time. Um, so this is really just a way to try to start to 
to extract different types of information from these things because oftentimes no one does anything with them other than you know have them and use them for highlight reels which is really important in getting people engaged in deep sea exploration um but but yeah just just as a you know this is really just a, a first step towards how we can we can make this better great okay um, in food terms, how much does chemosynthesis contribute to local primary production, including photosynthesis, photosynthesis overall? Uh, so uh, methane seeps are a really interesting uh, habitat because a lot, a lot of the organisms that live there don't depend too much on photosynthesis like almost every other habitat does. Um, so the local kind of the local production, uh, like primary production there on, uh, based on chemosynthesis it counts for the majority of, of the primary production at those sites. Uh, whether or not that's being, that production is being exported or used by kind of the adjacent communities that aren't necessarily associated with the methane seep is still kind of up in the air. But there have been some studies that, you know, there are commercial species that are feeding at these places or at least hanging out there. So they, like I mentioned before, the, the water can be pretty sulfitic in these places, um, which not a lot of organisms are, are very tolerant of. So the ones that we do see there, they could be, um, they could be avoiding predators, they could be feeding, they could, uh, we've also seen like a skate and shark eggs at these places just um maybe like a safe hiding spot for for breeding and eggs um so yeah great thank you next question has this been or could this approach be applied to other ecosystems and if so how would the metrics need to be adapted yeah um so the Biological trait approach is not new by any means, but from a, an ecosystem services specific kind of perspective, um, it hasn't been done too much. I think there's maybe two papers out there um, that have done it specific to ecosystem services. Um, I don't believe that there would be too much adaptation to kind of using this in a different kind of system. Um, if anything, it might be easier to get kind of like a repeated transect or or um, something a little bit more quantitative. Um, but yeah, it just kind of it it starts with kind of scoping out what services that you're interested in and then what what kind of data you can you can extract from it. Great, thank you. Um, next. Have you tried to tie the seafloor imagery to geophysical data, for example, multi-beam backscatter or water column data? Ooh, that's a great question. I have not personally. That's something that I would love to do. Um, the data set that I was working with uh, isn't wasn't too um, user friendly, um, so it was very hard to kind of associate that data with um more some more some of the other environmental parameters that were also being um collected but it would it's something that i would love to do great our next question is have you examined seeps with live oil seepage or have your results been constrained to gas seepage yeah uh i have not uh, looked at oil seepage, but in a lot of places, uh, methane seeps are associated with oil and gas deposits, um, just because you know there's there's hydrocarbons in 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 the area. Um, yeah. Okay. Next question: How does the gas chemistry influence the biota in the seeps? Presence of other hydrocarbons besides methane, butanes, uh, pentanes, exactly. Yeah. So, so other other than the hydrocarbons, uh, these seeps are often really uh, there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the water, um, which a lot of organisms don't really tolerate very well. 
Um, and in Southern California, it's a really interesting system just because of the oxygen minimum zone that can kind of um, intersect with the bottom um, and at some of these methane seeps. So you have this added kind of stressor of low oxygen, um, which, you know, a, a lot of organisms don't generally like, but there are some that are adapted to, to those low oxygen conditions. Did you see differences in seep morphology with depth? Uh, not necessarily with depth, but definitely between sites, uh, the morphology was really different um, with the seeps because especially, so our northernmost seep that's in the middle of the oxygen minimum zone, it actually sits within uh, like a, an underwater like um, river channel now. So it, it's instead of kind of like a, a wide, um, kind of like a wide area, it's a very long and narrow area, um, which is different from a lot of the other sites that we, we've seen. But it really just depends on um, kind of which, they're very site specific, not so much depth specific. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. This. Uh, these presentations have been recorded. We will be posting them up on the library's YouTube channel. And I wanna thank you all for coming.